excited to co-host tonight's panel discussion with the DC Arts and Humanities Education Collaborative. This is the second arts education event under CAH and the community, which is a new initiative led by DC Commission staff members. These presentations are designed to increase agency presence in the community and provide timely overviews, updates, grants, and program support. Tonight's event, the joys, challenges, and opportunities of virtual learning was developed to support the continuation of arts education in the virtual realm. A year and a half later, we never imagined we would still be conducting online programs, right? And even now that things are slowly returning back to pre-pandemic conditions, I also think this is an opportunity to continue reimagining and recreating arts education. While in-person school may be reestablishing, I don't think virtual programming is disappearing anytime soon. Some of you may have been facilitating virtual learning this entire time. Others may just be starting, and a few of you may be hoping to develop online offerings. No matter where you are in your professional journey, we anticipate that tonight's presentations will be useful. I am especially excited about the range of professionals and topics that we have curated for the evening. And I hope you find that the perspectives are as inspirational as you'd find them educational. And now I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thanks, Valerie. And good evening, everyone. Uh, so nice to see so many uh, friends and new friends uh, here this evening. And, and thanks to Allery and the staff at the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities for providing these CAH and the community conversations and in particular to the arts education community. Because we know how important it is for us to stay connected, especially in these times. And for many of you, you may recall the DC Collaborative pivoted rather quickly last year in providing daily and then weekly conversations uh, to have water cooler moments during a time that was of greater uncertainty. And some of the conversations that were dedicated uh, solely to you all, to teaching artists, I think were some of the robust and most collaborative conversations that we had during those months. So uh, I thank all of you for, for Make it for those that made the pivots and for those that helped and supported each other along the way. Um, and for all of the work that we continue to do together, knowing that indeed, as Allery said, virtual learning is here to stay. Um, and I, I can't go without saying uh, gratitude and thanks to all of our teaching artists this evening. You know, we're just days away from next week being National Teacher Appreciation Week. And you all are truly the front line. You are the essential workers uh, and the heart of student learning and growth. And thank you for your dedication, for creating opportunities for students to process and heal, as well as have joy of learning, all concurrent with your own times as we've moved through this past year and a half. So from the bottom of my heart and with tremendous gratitude, I thank each of you. Um, and I look forward to this evening's panel conversation. Thanks, Lissa. Um, uh, Tracy here. I also work at the DC Collaborative. I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping um, and just remind everyone to be on mute when they're not speaking. Um, we also have a suggestion um, when each of the presenters are sharing their screen to do the side-by-side -side speaker view. Um, so when uh, that is shared, um, you would just go up to the top next to where it says share screen and click on view options and then do a side-by-side. -side. Um, we'll highlight the speaker for you so you'll see who's speaking at the same time as seeing their slides. Um, and if you need any help, just write it in the chat, just a suggestion for you. Um, we'll also be using something called Mentimeter to do the Q&A. Um, so I'll, oh, thank you. Um, so I think that was Crystal that um, pasted the, the link in the chat. So you would just click on that. You can view other people's questions um, and um, put your own and there, there will be question and answer in between each panelist and then a, uh, a larger Q&A at the end. 
Um, so I'll just introduce Lauren um, now so she can uh, wave. She'll be the uh, facilitator for the questions. Okay, and Allery, I guess I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> yeah, all right. So we'll get started with our first presenter, Lenore Blank Kellner. Lenore Blank Kellner is an arts educator, arts integration specialist, theater and teaching artist who was awarded the Creative Drama Award from the American Alliance for Theater and Education. She has presented her work in all 50 states and abroad, including the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Currently, she serves as a consultant with the Maryland State Department of Education, the Maryland State Department of Education Fine Arts Division, and the Maryland State Arts Council. Lenore is also the author of The Creative Classroom and co-authored A Dramatic Approach to Reading Comprehension. Previously, Lenore served as a master artist for the Wolf Trap Institute for Early Learning Through the Arts, directed a professional theater company for young audiences, and directed and acted in a touring company under the auspices of the Regional Theater in Baltimore Center Stage. Please welcome Lenore. Great. Um, oh dear, hang on one second, everybody. The PowerPoint is not here. Hang on one second. I'm supposed to be showing off that I know what I'm doing. Here it is, why is it not there? All right, just one second. <clears throat> Sorry. There we go. All right. Can you see my PowerPoint? Would you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Great. All right. Well, it's very, very nice to be here. I decided to name my presentation tonight, Taking a New Path, A Journey Towards Virtual Success. <clears throat> And <clears throat> Allery asked me to kind of talk about the journey that I have had this year, um, year and a half, and uh, in hopes that it might lead to some thoughts about a path or a new path you might take. So in the beginning, this was me. When we got the news that schools had closed, that COVID was rampant, um, I was in the middle of a residency in Baltimore City Schools, and I was just about to start a residency for the Kennedy Center in the DC schools. And uh, all that came to a grinding halt. And um, in the beginning, I was just a tremendous amount of lethargy and sadness. I really could not get beyond you know, what is happening to my life as a teaching artist. I have been a teaching artist for 35 plus years. So that was the beginning of my journey. And then I tried to work and um, tried to get back to projects that I have been longing to do, but I completely had a lack of focus. Um, many of my teaching artist friends were encouraging me, oh, you got to get online, you got to do this, you got to do that. But I just I'd sit down and I couldn't get much done. I was very out of focus and didn't have the concentration to do things that I thought I would do if I ever had the time, but I couldn't do it. And then after people kept asking me, um, I kept talking to colleagues, I thought I have to find my own way. And what I decided to do was reach back, reach back to schools, principals, directors, people who I had worked with and said, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. You wanna come on this journey with me? Can we try something? Let's try our programming online. Are you ready to do it? And I was delighted that so many said, yeah, Lenore, let's go for it. Let's try it and see what, we've, what we get. And um, that was, it, was a real, it was a time of really feeling grateful for the people who have supported me all these years. Um, so then it became me taking the plunge. Um, I'm not a real tech person, um, but I decided I would take, I would learn what I needed to learn, not be all fancy all over the place, but learn what I needed to learn 
for online teaching and online professional development that I would lead. And I found that in order to do any of that, I had to rehearse and I had to rehearse and I had to rehearse so that I looked calm and like I knew what I was doing um, so that teachers felt, hey, she's calm, she knows what she's doing, maybe I can do it too. Um, so what are the results of all of that learning is that now I am doing professional development for teachers online, I'm doing workshops and I'm doing courses um, I'm planning and coaching with teachers. They're sending me video lessons and I, I submit um, either we have online uh, discussion or I send them feedback. Um, and as Ellery said, I have been consulting with the Maryland State Department of Education and also the Maryland State Arts Council. But now what they asked me to do was create checklists and rubrics for online teaching for teaching artists and provide them with feedback. So that made me do a lot of research about what is effective online learning. And, um, and it's been great to see how teaching artists are trying to adapt uh, their work to, these, to this new field, this new way of teaching. Um, I'm also delivering online classes directly to students and um, that's been eye-opening, uh, frustrating, and exciting. Um, I'm writing curriculum that integrates drama and English language arts for a school in Indianapolis. And I'm including online suggestions so that if, they're, if they end up to be a hybrid or go, before they go back or they're still online, they have suggestions. And this is the most amazing part is one of the people I reached back to, um, I had been doing some programs, been producing uh, young for young children and their families. And I was doing them uh, live before COVID and they decided let's try it online. And we started very small. I had one art teaching artist working for me and now I have three teaching artists working for me and we started off with 19 sessions, and now I have delivered over 250 of these online programs for young children and their families. So that just brought me to a whole new place. And that's the exciting part is like, once you go in this direction, sometimes something you just never expected to happen happens. So um, what are my new understandings from this is that everything has to be shorter there's less you can do in a session. Professional development has to be tight. It's not two or three hours, it's 90 minutes is what I find. And we need even more variety for kids. They can't sit there and attend and neither can teachers. So we need variety, we need movement and we need rigor. We need to show the schools that what we have is going to help our children um, move forward that we have something really valuable to offer. Um, also what I'm trying to do is in all my professional development is present work that could work online or in person so that wherever we go on this crazy time or where we ever, wherever we end up, that the work that I choose to share with teachers is something they can use no matter what the setting. And, I think what's really important for me and I'm hoping the schools is that acknowledging that parents and the home environment are key factors in students' online success. Um, the, hang on, oh, don't go away. Just one second. The, the last um, new understandings that I have is, um, Planning online has great value to plan with other teaching artists, to plan with my teachers. Um, it's been great. I mean, they're in their space. They can grab books. I can grab books. Um, we can, uh, we have our computers right in front of us so we can pull resources. Um, I feel like the other new understanding is that professional development, you can really increase attendance and access through this. Um, my collaboration with teaching artists has been very exciting in this process. 
observing them, giving feedback, talking about um, where what we want to achieve, you know, just constant experimenting with um, with the with this frame we're in and what can we do with it. And I, you know, I really do miss the teachers. I miss the students terribly. Um, it isn't an ideal format, but it does have merit. And I do think, agree with Valerie, it's here to stay. So that's what I wanted to share with you about my journey in this year. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can that might help you on your journey. Thank you so much, Lenore. Uh, that was uh, that was great. Um, we do one just popped up. I'm very excited <laughs> um, in the chat here. We have um, how do you collaborate with teachers ahead of time to tailor your workshops? Parentheses for your student workshops when they seem short on time. So I guess how do yeah how do you collaborate ahead of time to tailor um, for being I short on time? I, um, I'm not sure. Are they talking about professional development? Or are they talking about delivery to students? Um, how do you tell? Okay, I think how I get it now that I'm reading it a couple of times. Okay. Um, when working with teachers for your student workshops, how do you work with teachers ahead of time to tailor it when those teachers may be short on time themselves? Well, today is a perfect example. Um, I'm starting a residency. And um, I asked to observe the class. So today, um, before I start working with these kids in this setting, some are in, in their homes, some are in the classroom, is um, I asked to observe the teacher in the class with the students. And that just gives, gave me like just a, a vast knowledge of who the students are, how the teacher interacts with them. And then I asked the teacher to just give me 10 minutes of her time so that we could talk about questions that that brought up and what I learned. And we had already had a planning session, but I asked for an observation in 10 more minutes. And, you know, I go in on Monday and then it's what we all do. We just wing it, right? We just, after we plan our lesson, you just have to get in there and see what happens with the kids and keep refining it um, to meet the needs of the kids. So that's that's how I've approached the residency kind of component. Great. Um, from Carol Rogers, do you have a favorite platform that works? Um, yeah. Um, I and think there are variable platforms. How easy is it to adapt your work? I'm going to do a better job of reading the question before I start uh, in my head <laughs> before right. reading it out loud. That's OK. That's okay. Thanks for bearing with me. No, no. Um, I think for me, uh, if I'm doing professional development, um, Zoom is really something that works well for me. And one of my teaching artists, friends, and coaches, I think, is online. Marcia Daff taught me a lot about Zoom as did all my nieces and my, you know, I had everybody in the world on as I rehearsed and learned and figured it out. Um, and, but for our family programs, um, when we're going into the home, we've been using Google, Google Meet. And the reason I like that is it's just so easy for the parents, just like so easy for parents to go to the, to the link and we're there. Um, I have not, I've worked with Remo for big, like um, big uh, assembly kind of programs. And I think that is good for when you're approaching a big audience, but those are the only three platforms that I've used. And like I said, I'm not trying to get too fancy. I just wanna have something that works well for what I need to do. And I know the music people and dance people, it's, it's more complicated than it is for drama because, you know, we just need people to see us and hear us, you know, doesn't have to be all, <clears throat> all these things coming together. Oh, it does, but you can do it simply on these platforms. 
Great. So we just have one about one more minute for questions. These next two, I think, could ap apply for everyone at the end, but I'm going to um, do the first one here about group sizes. Uh, we have been experimenting with group sizes for online arts learning this year and have found smaller group sizes are better with virtual learning. What have you been your experience with class sizes? I think you touched upon that just a little bit in answering the last question, but if there's anything more you'd like to share about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if we can keep PD to 20, 25 teachers, if we can keep, we have to do a class, whatever that class is, obviously, but um, the smaller, the better, and the more you can put all of those faces on your screen and really address the needs of what's in front of you. Um, but we do have one family program. Today, we had a record of 44 parents and their families signing on. And, you know, that's challenging for, my, for our teaching artists, but we're so excited about that participation. Great. Uh, so I'm looking at the time. And so I want to, I think it's time to move on to our next presenter. Thanks so much, Lenore. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lenore. I'm going to introduce uh, Callie Simone Haney. She's a visual arts teacher. Um, Callie Simone Haney's passion for art began at the Brooklyn Museum as a seven-year-old, where she took her very first art class and had the unique opportunity to exhibit her work. Since then, she has taught visual art in various settings and currently is an art teacher at an independent school in Washington, D.C. She holds a BFA in general fine art and an MA in art education from the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art. And her husband, uh, she and her husband live in Silver Spring, Maryland with their three children. Hi everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I just wanna make sure that everyone can see my screen. Okay, can I get a thumbs up? Okay, great, great. Hi everyone. Um, uh, I'm Callie, and uh, I teach art at uh, Murray School uh, in Northwest, and um, I teach students in grades two, three, four, and six. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk with you all a little bit about uh, uh, my experiences teaching online for the past year and how it's changed my curriculum, and I'd say for the better. Uh, the work that you see here is uh, inspired by uh, an artist, Kara Walker, and you'll be seeing other work inspired by uh, some, several artists. I know this is the big timestamp, listening to Lenore, you know, talking about where uh, she was and what was happening when the pandemic began. Um, I thought it was only appropriate to include Ankawara's work there because I do feel like, or an homage to Ankawara, because I do feel like um, this date will forever be stamped and etched in my head. Uh, when the news broke that we'd been teaching or we would start teaching virtually, I knew that I was going to be in for a challenge. I wondered how I would guide my students handling of materials in a way that would help ensure the intended and accurate use of various techniques, especially with limited materials and compromised workspaces. I had no idea though of the joys I would find as I realized the flexibility within my discipline and also its potential to support me and my students through the various emotional stages of the pandemic experience. So I shifted my uh, curricular perspective from an emphasis on teaching skills and techniques to focus more on offering students opportunities to make expressive connections to current events through concepts and themes of working artists. I made the decision to teach through the lens of artists who created work that was rich with relatable themes of anxiety, uncertainty, optimism, endurance, hope, transformation, struggle, and ephemera. These are all concepts that easily connected to our collective pandemic experience. And at the same time, they helped to frame all of the processing um, all of what was going on in our, in our country. Students were motivated to make art because the lessons were grounded in something that was real and known. Uh, and this not only validated the, uh, their art making process, but also provided a more authentic um, art, artist experience for them. Research shows that creating environments where children are encouraged through verbal and visual explorations to relate artists work to their own worlds 
reinforces the meaning of art in life. Teaching art online with an emphasized focus on making connections gave me a chance to rethink my approach to teaching and create a more relevant curriculum for my students. I created lessons based on relatable concepts, intentional decision-making and reflection. My goal has always been uh, to teach from this foundation and virtual instruction provided me the opportunity to expand my students' understanding of all that art could be. One of the things that I recently have, I've just been reflecting on all of this is that it really allowed the process to slow down and I was able to find much more depth. Because art, art making was no longer restricted to the art studio at school, students could take part in the creative process from anywhere, at any time, and with unconventional and sometimes unusual materials. They could work on art for as long as they wanted, and it became more of a prominent part of their daily lives. For this reason, students also had the time to reflect on their ideas and decision making through written descriptions of their work, which has been my favorite thing, um, the best silver lining to come out of the uh, pandemic. And it's something that I've been always wanting to do in real time in bricks and mortar, but the, that slowing down really has helped them to have a little more reflection. All of the artists' behaviors that I've mentioned have further solidified the omnipresent aspects of art making. Students started to realize that art could have meaning and began to incorporate this notion into the work they made. And all of a sudden, these young learners became artists instead of students making art. It's always important to me to have students express their feelings in their work and teaching in this way gave me an opportunity to emphasize the relatable aspects of art as part of everyday experiences and also allowed me to take the emotional temperature of my students, which was something really important to me at the beginning of the year after being back when a lot of students thought that we were going to be back in person. Uh, so this really offered them an opportunity to, uh, or an outlet rather, to work through uh, all of the feelings that they had. To do this, I introduced this artwork, which is part of a series called Anxious Red Drawings by the conceptual artist Rashid Johnson. He uses red to communicate his feelings about his experience as a male, as an American, as a father, and especially as a Black person in this country. Johnson's drawing here and, and in the series includes a repeated image of a face drawn in a hurried mark. He uses this symbol often in his work and refers to it as the anxious man. This was a quote that we used to frame our thinking. And this has also been a pattern that I've developed over the pandemic is um, giving students quotes to uh, kind of spring from. It's been something that I think I'll carry uh, when uh, after the pandemic is gone and uh, we are teaching exclusively in bricks and mortar. Students were asked to, cho to choose a color that uh, represents their mood or represented their mood. And after we've learned, I showed them a few slides of how various artists use repetition and personal symbols in their artwork to communicate specific ideas. Students carefully made in their own intentional decisions about their compositional arrangement of their personal symbol. When they finished, they reflected on their process and wrote a statement to describe their work. So I'll share here a few of those statements. I chose a star surrounded by circles for my symbol. My star and circles are black because black for me is a mix of multiple feelings all in one. A star is something I draw when I uh, am to represent myself and circles make me feel whole and you need all of your feelings to be whole. Black also represents Black Lives Matter and that's a very important organization for me. The reason I arranged my symbols halfway is that 99% of the time, I only acknowledge half of my feelings. I have to say that, that this um, particular response was a very good topic uh, to bring up when we were assessing that student's emotional, <laughs> I mean, emotional interactions in the classroom. It was like, uh, yeah, well, it's all in the work. So they, they make good factual um, documentation uh, if they're ever, any uh, issues with, with particular students. <laughs> they're almost like little diary entries in a way um, that they're choosing to share with us. Uh, this is another uh, student, a third grader. These hearts represent me and the feelings of calmness. The hearts have different appearances because of change. Everything is changing. I feel like the world is changing around me in a way that feels the same, but in a different way than it was before. Like 
We are still at school, but, but at home. I arranged the hearts in the way that I did because they make you feel confused and I've been feeling confused. One of the things we spoke about with this work in particular and conceptual work is oftentimes there's not a lot that you can tell about the work uh, through the image. And sometimes the description ends up really becoming the artwork. And um, I have never seen my students express uh, their, their feelings in this way um, as clearly as they have in the description. So it was nice that there was that uh, shift. My symbol, and this is one last one, my symbol is a blue lock because inside my house I feel locked up in blue because everything is so gloomy, like the weather sometimes, and being on, on computers. I made a big lock with lots of little locks because lo locks, a lock locks everything, spoken like a second grader, <laughs> like computers in my head and also me in the house. Sculptor Doho So creates translucent fabric installations that include transitional spaces, like hallways and staircases, as a metaphor for his life experiences as an immigrant seeking a sense of belonging. In an effort to find solace, he stresses the importance of what we carry and how we survive and adapt to movement, change, and displacement. We are all struggling and still can continue to struggle to find ways to adapt to this, the displacement brought on by this pandemic. And since teaching students over Zoom to sew fabric sculptures like Doho So was totally out of the question for me, um, I decided to have them use a Mexican retablo as the medium for the concepts that Doho So expresses. It also gave me an opportunity to introduce folk art and talk about the difference between folk art and fine art. Uh, but a retablo is a devotional folk art ob object that honors a saint for divine intervention and protection. So in their retablos, the students focused on expressing gratitude for what has helped them cope with the challenges and uncertain of these uncertain times. This is, I have two to share um, from my sixth graders. My retablo is dedicated to reading for helping me through the pandemic. Reading allows me to escape what is happening in real life and enter the world of the book. In my retablo, I've drawn the book with a portal to show how reading lets me go into a world without the pandemic. My retablo is dedicated to my laptop for helping me through the pandemic. My laptop allows me to connect with friends and helps recharge me when I feel disheartened. And one of the great little happy accidents of this is that she has this image here of this battery kind of um, uh, losing, losing its charge and uh, the experience on Zoom, even though this computer is important to help her connect, all of the time that she spent on her computer has her Kind of feeling like her batteries need to be recharged. So there were some really great metaphors that the students were able to discover through these lessons. I'm grateful for how teaching online has helped me reframe uh, my curriculum to highlight art as a part of life and not just something that one does in their lives. I think my students' understanding of art will be forever changed uh, from this experience. It's been challenging, but also rich with many silver linings, almost to the point where I feel guilty about talking about all of the ways that um, this has been a great pers uh, perspective shift uh, for me. Um, I've been able to focus on possibility rather than limitations. And that modeling is a great model for my students. This is an artwork inspired by the work of Sister Carita Kent who use graphic design uh, techniques to communicate message about messages about faith. And my third graders chose quotes about gratitude to practice organizing information uh, in an effective way. And I, I feel that this quote sums up my virtual teaching experience. Uh, it says some people are always grumbling because roses have thorns. I am thankful that thorns have roses. I'm really honored um, and thank uh, CAH for having me uh, share my experiences with you all. Thanks. Thank you so much, Callie. I don't know about anybody else, but I got a little emotional when you read some of the students' responses about how they were feeling at the beginning. It was like, I had those same feelings. Um, waiting for, there are some wonderful comments about you in the chat. Uh, no questions yet, but um, in the meantime, I will ask what is something, what is a skill or um, an 
that you had um, prior to this that was sort of surprising how it showed up for you in online learning that you maybe didn't expect? Can you say that again? What is the skill? Yes, that I can. <laughs> I wrote it down for myself, but I'll. That's all right. That's all right. Um, what is a, you know, a, a prior skill or um, that you had or approach that you had? I guess maybe a skill or, or characteristic about yourself prior to the pandemic that you're like that you were surprised how it showed up or was useful um, during this oh, challenging sure. time. Yeah, if anybody knows my teaching, I'm always about, um, and this comes from my days uh, working at a uh, charter school where we had a curriculum that connected to over disciplines. I'm always looking for meaning in work and I'm looking for meaning in the connections and everything. Um, and I, in my students, I have always wanted to highlight how everything is connected, how art can be about meaning, how you can find meaning in things. Um, and I wanted, for, I, I wanted for them to really take ownership over the content in their work um, and utilize always the uh, foundations of, of teaching art techniques and skills to kind of bring those out. So it really allowed me to kind of find, I guess, find like tailor make um, to help students tailor make their work to really be specific in communicating their ideas. And I just, I, I, I don't know if I was in a rut or, or what, but there really wasn't prior to the pandemic time for me to delve into that as deeply as I was able to online. Um, and I guess them having that time away from, from being on Zoom where they could continue working on art uh, was really something that kind of helped me kind of hone own that um, ability that they all had um, kind of in. Great. We have a question here. Um, how has your own art been influenced by this experience? Your, present, your presentation was so inspiring. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Well, I like to consider my art just creating the lesson plans. Like I love creating these lesson plans. I love looking and learning about new artists. Um, I love trying to find um, things that they have said about their work that the students can connect to that kind of will push through the lesson and really taking all I love making PowerPoint I call it still calling PowerPoints so I've switched over to Google Slides now but I love finding the images and making those and I think in the deep down I was supposed to be like a graphic designer and an organizer of information although I just didn't have the time to do my best job on this uh, <laughs> slides uh, Google slide document but um yeah, I, I haven't, I have three children, <laughs> so art making, um, I live vicariously through, through my students. Often when people see the work, they say, you know, that looks like something that you would uh, be guiding. So um, I don't know, it's just the creation of lessons. That's what, that's really right now, what I am thinking is my work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a, a one last question to, that maybe you can answer in the chat when, um, we're done featuring you. And that's about, um, have you used any webcam and digital tools for teaching art from um, Anna or Anna? Okay. <laughs> um, but I think it's time to move on to the next presenter, but maybe you can type some of the uh, tools into the chat that you've used. Sure, thanks. All right, so we are moving on to Devin Walker. Devin is an award-winning children's artist who specializes in family funk. He is the owner of the Uncle Devin Show, an interactive musical experience for children that uses percussion instruments to cultivate their minds. He serves as a teaching artist with both the Wolf Trap Institute for Early Learning Through the Arts and Young Audiences Arts for Learning Maryland, and has performed at many different venues around the country, including the Kennedy Center's Millennium Stage, the Smithsonian's Discovery Theater, and the National Zoo. His children's book, The ABCs of Percussion with Music CD, and his Uncle Devin's Drum Tale CD have earned national awards. Devin created the first online music radio program for children called Watato Entertainment and Education, providing global beats for little feet. Currently, he also hosts the Uncle Devin's We Nation Radio 
on WPFW 89.3 FM. So I am going to look for Devin first so I can spotlight him. There he is. <laughs> and take it to you, Devin. All right. All right. All right. Well, first and foremost, um, I want to thank the D.C. Uh, Commission for the Arts and Humanities for allowing me to be here and also for the D.C. Arts and uh, Humanities Education Collaborative. The both of you all have been very important for me, especially once we got the word last year about the pandemic. Um, and so I just need to share that. And um, but also, if you notice, I just started with the drum and I do that because my teaching um, uh, as I learned to become a teaching artist, I always was taught that you start off with the art form. And so that was just a little introduction. But also, if you notice, it gets people's attention. And so that's one of the reasons why I do that. But I want to talk to you today about uh, my experience, but more so how I was able to navigate um, m much of what, it, what happened. Because the, the, one, the downside of, of course, not being in school is the fact that um, you know, you don't, children aren't able to touch the instruments. I used to, w I would bring in different instruments like a djembe drum or, or shakers, and then we would bring those to life as part of my experience. I primarily have been focusing on early childhood, uh, maybe up to the third grade, and um, uh, both in uh, do, do, dealing with STEM, but also a lot of reading um, uh, uh, lessons. But also, um, now, you know, having to switch to this new uh, uh, experience, I realized that the most important thing is that people need to see and hear you. So how do you get all of this sound so that people can see and hear you? And that's what I want to talk to you about. Because when each one of you signed on to Zoom, your Zoom immediately turns off your original sound. And for those who, have, who ever tried to uh, do a presentation and maybe you had a drum or a guitar and you tried to play it but they can they can only hear your voice and not necessarily hear the instrument it's because the zoom automatically turns off all the other outside noise zoom was primarily meant for meetings voice meetings and so i had to learn to go and turn on my original sound so that way you can hear these instruments while i play to, to make sure that people can hear. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can, um, so I can share with you some of the things that I learned. And let me just say that I learned a lot of this through trial and error. I spent money on things that I didn't need, but always got a receipt. So you can always take it back if you didn't, didn't need it. Uh, but let's see here, screen share. Uh, let's see. Are you seeing, no, I did the wrong one, hold on. I did the wrong one, I want my presentation. That's what I need. Okay, so you should be able to see my, uh, you, you're seeing my full presentation right now. And if not, uh, you can interrupt me because I can't see everyone else. But I consider this the art of online learning. There's an art where you can turn your screen, turn everything that you have into a part of your experience. But one of the most important parts of it uh, is being connected. How do you get connected? People, if people can't see or hear you, then you've lost the ability to really communicate with them. And as was mentioned by my colleagues before, and they did a, a wonderful job, there are different platforms that, you, that, that you'll find yourself using. Zoom, Google Meets, StreamYard is one. I've used all three. These are the primary ones that I've used. The one thing that you have to do, though, is you're going to have to take your time and get to know the platforms. Uh, there's no substitute for going to YouTube and just doing a use YouTube, YouTube search and literally just watching the many different videos of people explaining how to use the different devices that you have so that you can get connected. It, it, it was time sensitive or it, it definitely took time to do it. But again, you figure it's, most videos were between five and ten minutes long. Um, and you took, you know, I took notes. Uh, it was a learning curve because a lot of these things I just did not know until I was really forced uh, to learn these things. And then the technology. How, uh, for example, when you heard me playing the, the sound just now through uh, my drum pads, 
how do I get that connected into the computer so that you can hear it almost as we call in studio? And primarily, these are a lot of the technology, a lot of the technology that I that I found that is a lifesaver um, that may not cost too much, uh, depending on your budget. But I, I, I will look at the first one where you see the black microphone and the headset. This is called an interface. And gratefully, I already had an interface because I do recording. And what the interface allows you to do is connect your microphone and maybe one other device, uh, or depending on how many outputs you have or inputs you have, uh, you can connect um, your, uh, if you're a guitarist, for example, you can connect your guitar to it or uh, an iPad if you want to play music um, or whatever, whatever the type of device you have. And then out of the back of the interface, it goes straight into your computer as a USB. So what it does is it expands your computer so that you can be able to get um, the type of sound and be able to produce everything that you, you want uh, in a very clear way. And so what, you, what you're hearing me talk through right now is I have a wireless microphone, I have earbuds in my ear, uh, all connected to the red uh, interface that we have there, but all the way to the right, uh, the device that, that there's two uh, uh, devices that plug directly into the wall was really my ultimate lifesaver. It's called a power line adapter. I have all of this information in a resource that, that they will be sharing with you. So you don't have to worry about taking all the, the notes from this. But a power line adapter is what allowed me to connect my Ethernet anywhere in the house. If you know what an Ethernet cable is, it looks a little bit like a phone cable, but it's a lot thicker. And it goes into your computer and it goes directly to your modem. That way you can get a direct signal. You don't have to worry about the Wi-Fi signal because here in my uh, where I live, the Wi-Fi signal is iffy. So you will plug one of those power adapters uh, where your modem is, and then you can connect the other one anywhere else in the house. It uses the wiring in your home uh, as, a, uh, as, as a connector. Now you can connect your Ethernet anywhere you are in the house and therefore have that type of strong connection um, to be able to um, uh, make sure that you stay in, in, on, on point. And so these are, these are just two of many of the different things that I've really discovered through my technology uh, that helped me to really com communicate so that the, the teachers and the children can hear and see what I was doing because it was very, very important um, to what I was uh, discussing. And again, this is a closer, uh, another picture of the power line adapter as well as this is another picture of the interface. You can either get a, uh, a mixer, a small mixer that has a USB cable, but as you see, this just has two different inputs that, that we use. And I just happen to have one that has four inputs that gives me a little bit more flexibility. Um, and I don't want to get too technical, but I, and I, I will leave my information. If anyone wants, um, needs any questions or have any questions about it, I, I'll be able to share uh, more with you. But these are just more um, information that I've, I've discovered. But if you notice that even in my background that I have here in my, um, uh, what I'm sharing with you now, I'm using a green screen, which is huge for me. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment. But right now my green screen really allows me to do so many different things because if you notice children, uh, their, their minds are always active and they're looking for, um, th they're stimulated both by sight and by sound. And so depending on what I'm doing and I'm teaching, I, I've learned to use the Zoom or, or my background to be able to change different things, uh, the, uh, to, to, to change the background based upon what I'm dealing with. So if I'm dealing with counting numbers, then now I'm saying, okay, well, I give them something where we count numbers. Perhaps we're dealing with something that deals with, um, that is raining outside. Well, now I'm in the rain and now I can create the, the use their imagination to create different things for them, um, you know, in this regard. All right. I said, well, we're going to the White House. Let's go to the White House and let's talk about different things that are in the White House. That was one of our lessons uh, that we taught. Or we were dealing with uh, the coral reef and what we are, what, what's, you know, what is the coral reef? And I would generally have different songs to go with them, but this helps to create the illusion and the, uh, the experience even more using something very simple uh, like our like our computer. So uh, I, I have many more, but I just want to share with you that for me, using a green screen and being able to um, 
create the environment really helped, and, and the teachers really felt that it, uh, it kept the children engaged uh, a lot in what we were uh, focusing on. And I know also, and I'll, I'll go back to my presentation and then I'll end, uh, I've also learned how to use uh, pre prepared videos. Um, of course, I can pl I'll, I'll play a lot of these different uh, instruments, but I've learned that of course, the, not the children not being able to have percussion instruments to shake was oh, oh, and to and to scrape and to strike. That's how you become a percussionist. Was very difficult for me, so I had to go back and realize that they have things in their home that we can convert into percussion instruments. So you may not have a shaker or a tambourine, but you got a set of keys. So I will have them find things around the house that they can shake. And then we will turn and transform these different things or just using their, their, their mindset about things that we have around the house that we may shake, scrape, and strike like salt, salt and pepper shakers. And don't worry, these are not real, so they won't be, uh, there's nothing uh, <laughs> uh, leaking out of here. Um, and, 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 but the, the one thing about doing that is just showing them that they have music around them in their environment, wherever they are. And one of the, um, uh, the the I'll, I'll go back to the screen real quick and then I will end. Uh, there's so much I can just share with you, but I, I have really learned a lot about uh, myself in this whole process. And um, okay, share screen. Let me go back to my presentation. Which one I want? I think it's this one here. And this is one where I used um, uh, again. I was when I was doing a presentation. I would uh, create different backdrops that people can can experience. Uh, this too was just actually part of a, 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 a sample video that I did, and and watch how I use movies as a part of it. Um, and I didn't share my sound, so you won't be able to hear the sound right now. But at least the most important thing is looking how I use images and video behind me during sometimes during the class to be able to keep their attention because now their mind is also looking at what's going on and hearing what we're saying. And so, um, and then this is a, uh, there's an app that I used called the acapella app um, where I was teaching them how to play the table. Everybody here, I'm sure at some point was playing, uh, did a beat on the table with the spoon, the fork, a cup or something like that, whether they were younger or, or older. And so I created a, a, a video for this called the tabletop groove where I used the, uh, the app acapella and then I was able to weave that into uh, my lesson um, to give them a, an experience on what it really looks and sounds like. And so there's so many different um, options uh, that we have. There's some other things uh, that you can use for screen recordings like the OBS studio, which I have not mastered yet. Um, I'm still, um, that's something I said, I, I still want to take some time uh, to learn, but it allows you to capture and, and present things off of your uh, off your com computer screen. Uh, Flashback Pro and um, a PowerSoft free online uh, software. But as I mentioned, I'm going to be sharing with you a list of uh, tech, uh, technology resources for online music and art classes uh, and links and pictures of different hardware and software to enhance your online experience. There's probably there's definitely so much more that I can share, but uh, but I would just say that for me, um, just imagine I'm a drummer and a percussionist. I don't have to carry all this right now. At least I haven't for a year. So my body feels great. <laughs> and and I really have come to enjoy this process and it's given me an opportunity now to share my sound around the, around the country and the world, which I really, really appreciate. So uh, for me, it's been a, um, it, it was a shock initially, but um, I now have grown to love it and I look forward to uh, being able to share and teach online. So I hope um, if there's any questions, let me know. But I know that I covered a lot. But uh, just thank you again for letting me uh, share with this. And, and definitely you can do it. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. I love how you played yourself in. <laughs> Maybe we'll have you play us out. <laughs> okay. um, so we're going to stick to one question. Just I want to be mindful of time. Um, and then maybe I'll suggest that in our follow up with everybody, the questions that weren't answered, maybe there's time to like type out some answers. So um, for this is for the music teachers out there. Do you have any advice for conquering lag times when a group of students is singing or playing instruments together? 
And um, I think you answered the software question. Okay. And, and that's and from Joanna from Capital City Public Charter School. And repeat the question again. Uh, do you have any advice for conquering lag times when a group of students is singing or playing instruments together? So, oh, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the latency is what we call it. Um, uh, no, the, the technology hasn't, I have not found that there's technology that allows uh, that to happen. And, and for those who may not know, it, it, you may, if, if everyone right now unmuted, don't, don't unmute. But if we did and we try to sing a song together, we will all be off because we were here at a different times. The best way to do it, however, is using an app like acapella and you do it one at a time. And one, one person will, uh, perhaps the teacher can start with the, to set the tone and then you send it to another student, they add their part and then another student will add their part. And that's the best way that you can really capture um, something uh, to that extent. Um, it is very difficult and typically when I'm performing, I still ask everyone to be on mute because if I'm singing a song and they're singing with me, they can be a whole half a beat behind and it, could be, it can literally throw you off. So. Uh, I don't think the technology has caught up with that yet. Great. I think that's all we have time for in the moment, but uh, we'll make sure to get the other questions to you as well. So I think we're ready for our next presenter. Okay, thank you, Lauren and Uncle Devin. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Ariel Gori. Um, Ariel Gori is the lead education specialist for early childhood programs at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. She develops programs for children ages zero to eight that support their positive identity development, joy in human diversity, sense of justice, and ability to advocate for themselves and others. Ariel also designs resources and workshops to empower caregivers and educators in talking about race, history, and culture with young children. Hello everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Tracy. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ariel Gori, and I design and lead early childhood programs at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm feeling super grateful to be here with you all today and the other presenters um, and sharing with you a little bit about what my team and I have learned over the past few months. Um, since launching and piloting some of our programs, um, activities, and online resources. Um, so before becoming virtual, uh, this is what learning in our museum looked like. Uh, we had weekly and annual programming for families, infants and toddlers, three to eight-year-olds, um, with opportunities for up close and personal interactions with objects and art in our museum. We had really interactive story times and music classes and performances. Um, and we designed our programs to invite children to actively participate in their learning with their whole bodies um, in different ways, rather than just looking at things through glass. On the other side of the screen is what our work has ultimately turned into now being online. Um, with a lot of hard work and deep thinking, um, you're looking at the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture's Joyful ABCs activity books that are accompanied by a weekly program we lead called Joyful Fridays, where we take one activity from the booklet and lead a lesson about it live online. Um, with this program, we have learned a lot about what works well and what are the joys of doing this really important work right now um, and what are the challenges and limitations of this work um, and how we can overcome them. I'm going to share with you four guidelines that we try to follow when we're developing our virtual programs in hopes that they will help you to not only connect with young children, if that's the audience that you serve, but also with adults. Um, whether they're in relation to children or just on um, just joining your programs on their own. Um, I believe that as we grow into adulthood, we often forget or leave behind the things that we um, really loved about childhood. But I'm a strong believer that we can all find some joy in reincorporating some of those things we typically consider for kids um, into our programming for adults as well. So whoever you are serving um, with your program, I am always encouraging folks to 
um, really know your audience. Um, even though children are a little more tech savvy than they were about a year ago, um, and we've all somewhat adjusted to this screen life, um, children still learn best when they are looking at something, hearing something, touching something and doing something. And at first I felt like these four things were instantly lost when we moved into the virtual world. And it felt like it took some time to really remember that despite the fact that I'm not able to see the children on the other side of the screen a lot of the times or that I'm designing PowerPoints to show them, um, I really need to remember that I'm doing this for children. And so this ends up impacting the colors and the fonts on my slides the words in my scripts and the choices that I make in lesson planning. Um, I try to keep that really at the forefront of my mind because it's easy to forget when I'm not actually seeing them in person. Um, in our programming, we choose accessible materials. Um, one of the challenges of doing virtual engagement online for us was that we could no longer just buy all of the materials we want and put them out for visitors to use. Um, I imagine that that was probably one of the fun things about coming to the museum uh, was that you got to do something or use something differently than what you were doing or using at home. So we'd always buy interesting things to have at different stations. And we realized, however, that while some families um, out there, who there's families out there who might have really stocked up on the different kinds of materials um, over the past year. There's also folks who just have basic tools for creating art. And in order for us to be accessible to um, folks that are across um, socioeconomic statuses as well, we wanted to make sure that no matter what you have to work with at home, you could still participate in our programming in a meaningful way. So. Many of our projects actually really just use markers, crayons, and paper with the occasional appearance of glue and recycled materials. Um, there are some projects where we're adding paint or we're adding something just a little bit different, um, but we're still making sure that even if the participant didn't have those extra things, they'd still be able to make something pretty awesome. Um, I wanted to show you what we've, how we've gotten creative with those um, basic materials um, to introduce very different kinds of projects. So simply with just uh, markers, crowns, and paper, what we've been able to do. Um, and here is our maps for our B is for Brave themed um, activity. We were able to make an emotions chart for our E is for emotional theme. And with paper bag, um, markers, crayons, um, we were able to make a little carrier for a dollar stuffed animal friends for our L is for loving theme. So with three of many different projects, um, but I believe all equally engaging and um, accessible to the age group that we're serving, um, we were able to use simple materials but made them more accessible to children um, who may not have ever even been able to come to our museum themselves before. Um, we also never do a program without another very important thing, um, and that being our imaginations. Um, imaginative play and moments for movement and activities that engage all of a person's senses um, enhance the learning experiences for all ages. Um, movement keeps children and adults engaged, whether it's a big body movement or just a small exercise with your hands and pretending to do something can really help to deepen a learner's knowledge or understanding of a theme or a topic. Um, that was something that I thought, I don't know, it felt a little weird at first to ask someone to dance with us when, when I can't see them dancing or to ask someone to sing along with me when they're not really there. Um, but it's, it's something that we realized we can't um, let go. And I think as adults, we tend to use our imagines a little less and less as we grow, um, but being able to imagine a scenario or an object or just to play pretend is a really powerful way to engage someone's mind and to change the kind of learning you're doing. And so um, I'll show you what that has come to look like in our programs. Um, each week, um, my teammate Tammy and I lead a weekly Joyful Fridays program where we start off the program talking about objects. 
And during our program about um, May Reeves hats, we asked participants to reach into the screen and grab the hat that was on the screen to put it on their head and imagine wearing the different kinds of hats that we showed. We imagined the texture of them or where you would wear that hat. We even pretended that our fingers were feathers and counted each of them and made them move. Um, we invited children to even bring their own hats um, to wear and to touch um, and to tell us about. Um, we really believe that it's important that our programs go beyond just making an art project, um, beyond just the craftiness of it, and make it a little bit deeper and always connected to our collection, our history, and our cultures. And um, imagination has really helped us do that. So we're pairing that playful, imaginary um, time with the um, art project, um, again, using very accessible materials, but a little bit differently each week. So I would encourage folks to look for ways where your audience can participate, even in their minds, um, or even in a small, small movement with hands, or just standing up for a moment um, and inviting imagination and movement will really change the kind of learning that's going on in um, the programs in a good way. Um, last, but definitely not least um, important, I wanted to talk about the challenge of making space for communication with our audience. Um, early on, we decided that we wanted to honor the learners on the other sides of our screens by remembering who they were before this new virtual lifestyle we've all taken on. Um, by really thinking of them as people who have something to say, um, as humans who feel, who wonder, who create things, and not just a person who's watching or doing what we say step by step. Um, a challenge I faced personally is in the educational theory, like at the core of the museum education that I practice. Um, I typically believe that a strong museum program consists of about 10% me talking and about 90% of visitors controlling their learning um, through informal conversations, self-guided activities, opportunities really to explore topics in depth on their own, at their own pace and in their own style. But being virtual is really a challenge to that. Um, I can't have it and only talk for five minutes of it and make it worth, I think, showing up. So we're, we're trying to find ways to make sure that we're incorporating communication. Um, but one challenge to that as well is institutionally as a um, large museum um, to ensure the safety of minors participating in our weekly programs, we've made them webinars. And so that we've taken away the opportunities for, um, for our users to communicate via the chat with each other, as well as um, to be able to speak out loud. So that means that they can only see us and only write to us. Um, and this was hard to adapt to, but the awesome thing is in doing webinars is that it, it has allowed for hundreds of children to participate from around the world all at once. I think our highest um, number was almost 600 kids were with us online at the same time, which never really happens. Um, so we believe that talking about something is essential to learning about it, um, but how are we doing that? We are asking questions throughout the program um, that we're inviting, we're inviting participants to answer in the chat box. Um, oftentimes their parent might be writing for them, but sometimes we do have children who are writing to us um, or they we're asking them to say their answers or share their experiences out loud with the person who they may be working with that day. Um, we are incorporating pauses to make space for that thinking, talking and typing. And I think that at first it was feeling a little uncomfortable to sit there and ask a question and then kind of do the um, Sesame Street thing where you just pause and almost pretend um, that you're hearing something, but knowing that, that leaving that space for a child to, um, to share has been really important, even if we can't hear them. Um, so we read the chat out loud to the people who are participating virtually, and we found that people are really grateful for that opportunity to contribute their um, opinions or experiences. They love to hear it read out loud. Um, and this has especially brought me and my team so much joy to be able to do that and to know that there are people out there really actually thinking and learning and creating with us. Um, so I will leave you all with this, just a reminder of these 
really important points for me. Um, know your audience. Even if you haven't interacted with a real life person in person for a long time, um, try to remember who they were before they became just a name that was popping up in the waiting room or um, a person that you're just seeing on screen. The kinds of things that they enjoyed um, and the styles that they learned in are still relevant. Um, choose accessible materials. It's always a little extra fun to use more complex materials, but remembering to design activities that can be done with even the most simple materials will allow for more people to gain something from your program. Um, don't forget to use your imagination, um, invite opportunities for movement or play, even with adults. And lastly, um, make space for that communication, knowing that communicating with our participants has not only brought us a lot of joy, but it's also important um, in the way that it deepens the learning. Um, thank you so much for letting me share a little bit about the joys and the challenges of our programs at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I hope you all leave today um, feeling a tiny bit inspired to do something new by anything you heard me talk about, but also um, my colleagues that were here today were super awesome. Um, and please feel free to join us sometime at our Joyful Fridays program. Thank you. Or maybe so. Thanks so much, Ariel. Uh, uh, we don't have any questions at the moment, okay. but I'm also looking at the clock. <laughs> um, so actually this question was for Uncle Devin, but I think uh, I think probably this is applicable to you as well. How do, um, do you have ways, what are some ways you encourage um, your young folks to participate when you can't hear them? Young learners, you, even if you are doing a face-to-face -face and they're repeating themselves, they're hard to understand, but are there ways that um, you've encouraged them? I'll just say real quickly, as a as a drummer, the way that you become a percussionist is that you shake, mm -hmm. scrape, and strike. And I use body percussion as a, a form of communication. And we establish certain signs that if they understand me, they might they might do this, which means uh, yes, they understand me. If they don't understand me, we, we may do something like this. And I use that a lot in in what I do to reinforce the music element, but also to in, in, to introduce uh, communication. That's one of the ways that I do it. Great, um, Ariel. Was there something you were going to add to that as well? Yeah, I I would just say that um, we've just taken a lot um, similar to what um, Uncle Devin was saying about just like using the body a lot more. Um, being able to use the whole rectangle that is around us to, um, in a, I don't know, in an, in a fun way um, and not just sitting there. So every once in a while, really just asking them to make the same shape that they see on the screen or to um, imagine that they're doing the painting with their actual, um, an, an imaginary paintbrush or something like that. Um, we're trying to, um, even though we may not be able to hear or um, see what they're doing, that just being able to participate physically with their body has been, I think, super, super um, helpful and important to them. Great. Thank you so much. We do have one more <laughs> presenter, so I will turn it over um, to, for them to be introduced. Yeah, so we have Trey McMichael from the DC Arts and Humanities Education Collaborative closing us out. Trey is an arts leader and performer who is passionate about community engagement, arts education, and social justice. He is a graduate of Elon University and currently pursuing his MFA in arts leadership at Seattle University. He has worked with various nonprofit and arts organizations such as Arena Sage, Maryland Leadership Workshops, and the NAACP, and has performed on the stages of Mill Mountain Theater, Theater Rally, Lyric Opera Baltimore, Signature Theater, and Lincoln Center. Through his work as the Education Programs Manager at the DC Arts and Humanities Education Collaborative, Trey strives to make the arts sector more inclusive and equitable for all. And I am going to spotlight him. Thanks, Allery. Hey, everybody. So I know we are running on 
the nick of time. And so I'm going to give the abbreviated version of my abbreviated PowerPoint. Um, just get into the, the main points here. So the title of this is Building a Better Plane. Again, my name is Trey, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the DC Collaborative. So the thing I want you to think about is with your arts integration, your arts education, are you building the plane while you're flying it or are you building a better plane and having a better flight? Um, and so in this presentation, I wanna share five steps to having a better flight um, that'll be helpful uh, for you. That's been helpful for us as the work we're doing at the DC Collaborative. Some of my peers who've also presented tonight, we're talking about March 2020. And for us, that was a really big deal. We had a third of our programming um, set to happen between March and the end of the school year that got completely canceled. And so hundreds of students who were going to engage in our members' educational programming didn't get that opportunity. Um, and we were unsure of where to go. And Lissa mentioned at the beginning that we pivoted pretty fast. Um, and I'll get to a little bit of how we did that and why that was important for us in a second. So our plane that I talk about in this presentation is our Arts and Humanities for Every Student program. So the DC Collaborative works with multiple types of stakeholders, um, our members that are arts and cultural institutions, um, as well as teaching artists and practitioners, uh, DC public schools and public charter schools, as well as the local government. So we work very closely with the DC Commission. Uh, tonight is a manifestation of that relationship, um, as well as with the city government for some of our advocacy work. And so through the office program, our members create educational programming, and then we connect their programming to the schools um, and we ensure that it's high quality. Um, we have different workshops to make sure that our members are connecting their, their educational programs to the curriculum. Um, and we end up serving around 50,000 students a year through that relationship um, and that constant back and forth of how do we serve the students um, with the best of the best. And so the first step in building a better plane, and this is something we did uh, for several months is evaluating the situation. What elements are at play internally, externally, and around the work of your organization? So some ways that we did this was through our community conversations and convenings. Uh, in the very beginning of the pandemic, we had them every single day, but we thought that was valuable, giving people a space and a time to share what their needs were, what their challenges were, especially in unprecedented uh, environment. We also had several surveys that we sent to our stakeholders um, and internal meetings as well to discuss our capacity and bandwidth to engage in this work. But the pandemic wasn't the only thing going on, right? That was one piece of it. We also had the election happening in DC, one of the most powerful political cities in the world. Um, that had an impact on our students and our staff and our membership. The Black Lives Matter protests, economic hardship, uh, systematic racism, institutional racism, all of those issues are a part of the situation. Um, and understanding that as it plays to the work of our members, as well as our students and our greater community is important for moving any plan forward. The next part for this was centering our mission. How is, the how is your plan, project, or pivot advancing the mission of your organization? And so this is something that's important as well. You know, sometimes the work that you wanna do doesn't always align with the work that you need to do. Um, I have to remind myself all the time that I am not my organization, but the mission is my organization. And that if the work that we're doing doesn't rest on that, what is the purpose of the mission? Um, so our mission is rooted in equitable access for arts and humanities education. And when thinking about moving forward with the work, if it wasn't connected to that, it wasn't a priority for us. In times of conflict and chaos, when you double down on your values, that's the important thing, not abandoning them. The third step is invite others to dream with you. So are you doing work to and for others or in and with them? Don't be afraid to dream the big dreams. Just don't do it by yourself. Um, you do not have to be the gatekeeper of success for your organization. We asked our members, uh, in an ideal world, what would be the best outcome for you? What are the best needs? What are the best things that you need um, to move this work forward? Knowing that the ideal for everyone is not going to be impossible to achieve, but if we don't ask, if we don't allow everyone to dream together, there's no way to move forward and work towards that uh, shared goal, shared idea. 
At the collaborative, we did this through our committees, our members meeting, and our advocacy work. And some of this can also be done through assessment and evaluation of your program. Getting the perspective of your students and the educators is vital to adding them and adding their, uh, their thoughts about your programming to making sure they're uh, continuously improving. The fourth is let your failures lead you. What valuable lessons can you take with you after missing the mark? I'll be real honest, we failed a ton. And I know we are not the only ones. We had low registration for our programs, Zoom hacking, uh, confusing language, over communication, under communication, all of that was into play. And what we did was we learned from that. We went to our members, we went to our schools, we said, hey, we didn't do this quite the right way this time. What can we take from that to redesign? Um, it's just strategically restructure our programs and interface so that they become more successful. We did that by creating an online database um, and setting several bars of, uh, you know, testing things and working with people to see, you know, does it work this way? Does it work that way? And then releasing something to the greater, greater community that was going to be more successful. And that leads me to my last point, number five, celebrate the success that you define. What does organization success look and feel like for you? If you wait to celebrate based on everyone else's definition of success for your program, that party may never happen. We had internal happy hours with our staff to celebrate our individual and collective work, as well as bond internally as a staff. Set a bar or a goal that you want to see accomplished or advanced through your work. Once you reach that point, take it in, enjoy it, reevaluate, and then set new goals. For the collaborative, this was exceeding the number of students who interacted with our programs virtually by 10,000 than we had interact with our programs in person during the same period before the pandemic, or an increase in the programs offered by our participating members and organizations in DC. So we celebrate those milestones knowing that there are other bars that we need to reach, but it's good to celebrate where you are based off the definition that you set for yourself for success. And the last thing I'll leave you with is, even when you have built a better plane, never fly on autopilot. So once the foundation is there for a successful program, continue to elevate your positionality. Changes and obstacles will happen. They are inevitable. But instead of having to attach a new engine, you will just have to fly your plane in a new direction. Thank you so much for my speed round presentation. If you want to dream of the collaborative and be a part of the work that we're doing, all of our information is over here, but it's also on this last slide. Um, thanks again for coming to this event and I hope that everyone's taking something away. Thank you, Trey. That was, um, I, I don't, you like wrapped it up really well. <laughs> We're all ready now and we have confidence to do our virtual programming. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over. I don't have any specific questions at the moment for you, Trey, but I'm going to turn it over to Allery or Tracy to kind of lead us into next steps. Yes. Yeah, so we want to be mindful of time, of course. So I think we are going to um, cut the, the last kind of Q&A that we were planning on having just to be mindful of everyone's time. I am going to share my screen, though, because I do want to make sure that both organizations make it clear that this is not our last event. We have a few things coming up. And so just to share with you all um, what's coming down the pipeline with both organizations. Um, so give me one second. Okay, so um, the DC Collaborative, of uh, DC Collaborative, the DC Commission <laughs> has um, a lot of grant programs that are opening on Monday, May 3rd, but specifically for arts education, the Arts and Humanities Education Project, and the Arts and Humanities Fellowship Programs are both opening on Monday. And so that's when the applications will release, as well as the guidelines and all of the information that you need. So those who are um, based in DC, either individual artists or organizations, um, should definitely look out for that. And um, the best way, of course, is to sign up for our email list, or to follow us on social media, and you'll know exactly when those grant programs are being released on Monday. 
Also later next week, we are having a teletown hall for the commission where we will talk more specifically about all of the grant programs that we are releasing next week um, for the fiscal year. 2022. And then specifically for arts education, on May 21st, we're having a DCPS Teletown Hall. And that Teletown Hall is also in partnership with the DC Collaborative, where we will allow um, some of the leadership people to just talk more about what's happening in DCPS specifically, which will hopefully also be helpful to individuals and organizations that are crafting their arts education grant applications and can have more information about COVID regulations and what their reopening plans are as, um, again, individuals and organizations try to figure out what's possible in the schools and what can be offered. And then on May 26, we are having a workshop with Diane Nutting, um, which is called Inclusion Best Practices in Arts Education and Settings. That's also in partnership with the DC Collaborative. So you're probably starting to notice a thread here, <laughs> but information about that will also be released soon where people be, will be able to register um, and will hopefully also be um, helpful as you're crafting your programs for next school year. And I will move to the next slide and turn it over to Tracy. Uh, great, thank you so much, Allery. So um, we're in cycle three of our uh, spring arts and humanities for every student programming. Um, oh, we're in our spring uh, lottery cycle for this uh, arts and humanities for every student programming. Uh, the cycle three um, is opening up on May 17th. Um, we'll have a lot of social media and everything around uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, so uh, next week, so please follow our social media. Um, we'll have our second advocacy workshop about communicating the value of arts and humanities education on May 12th, um, where participants will divide out, uh, divide up into breakout groups. Um, and uh, craft messages based on um, their needs. Um, we have a teaching artist and practitioner fellowship institute. So um, uh, teaching artists of all um, uh, experience levels are encouraged to apply to have um, professional development training from Karen O'Brown, Sylvia Zui, and um, Reggie Kabiko around uh, integrating the arts and social emotional learning. Uh, and then we have a connecting to curriculum series opening with DCPS social studies on June 2nd that Trey is organizing. Um, and uh, members are invited to submit their programs for next year on June 21st for the office Arts and Humanities for Every Student program launch. And then um, we'll uh, wrap up this fiscal year for us on June 22nd with a membership meeting called the, the State of Any Given Child DC. Um, so we hope you can join us for some of these and um, hope to hear you soon. Oh yes, and thanks Lisa in the chat, the Teaching Artist uh, Fellowship Institute is funded by the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and um, all of the award goes to the lead teaching artist and um, there is a stipend for each fellow. Um, so I'll share uh, more information in the recap. Okay, well, I think that is it for the evening. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you all so much to our presenter, um, who presented some great topics and uh, PowerPoints, <laughs> very interesting presentation. So thank you all so much and have a good night.